Hey, so I want to give a little life update. If you don't know my name, my name's Chris. i one of the pastors on staff here. And um, been married for eight years. Not 15, but eight. We're, we're coming up, all right? And for those that don't know, my beautiful wife is pregnant. Incredible, incredible. Just God's redemption. And we're just so grateful that we get to, we get to share it with you. And just so you know, our almost five-year-old daughter, Selah, I asked her, hey, so... Do you want a brother? Do you want a sister? I don't want a brother. Uh, I'm like, well, you don't get to choose that. You can pray and ask the Lord, and we'll just, we'll, we'll just see what happens, okay? And so we're excited for that. We're excited that we get to share that with you. And today, guys, we're going to be in part um, three or four in recalculating. Turn your neighbor and say recalculating. We're going to be diving into Romans chapter six today, and so... Um, if you have a Bible, open that up. If it's on your app, open up your app. If you don't got any of that, that's okay. I'm going to have it on the screen. But I, I, I have a question, everybody. How many of you like to wait? Man, like, the, the energy just went down when I said that. <laughs> it's like most of us would say we're not great at waiting, but the majority would say I don't even like waiting at all. You know, I, I'm learning that with my uh, five -year -old, almost five-year-old daughter, Sayla, where, you know, this last week, um, she knows, it's, it's amazing how kids can take in the details. She knows that there's leftover ice cream from the night before. So she gets up, hey, daddy, can I have some ice cream? And I can't even say there's none in there because she knows that there's in there. I'm like, baby, you got to wait until at least after lunch. No, no, no. I don't got to wait for ice cream. Ice cream's good. And I, I think that, you know, we think waiting is a kid's problem. But I think if we're being honest, waiting's a, a people problem. I think none of us like to wait at all, and the best thing and worst thing that's ever happened to me has been that you can, you can track your packages coming to your house. Am I the only chronic person that will check every five minutes? I'll get an email update. I'll get a text update. Oh, you have an app? I want an app update, too. I want all of it, okay? And something else about me is that, man, <laughs> this is the, the more you get to know me, you know how much of a nerd I am. I love planners. Planners just minister to my soul. Why would you want chaos? Why would you want to go through the flow with a planner? So, um, I, hey, if you have a new planner that I don't know about, I want to hear it, but I'll probably try it out, okay? And so long story short, I got a new planner. And then, hey, expect some delay because of COVID. Okay I, can, okay, I can do that. I can expect some delay. Not, not too much delay, but I can expect a little bit of delay. Long story short, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. It should have been delivered a week ago. And I am checking every update. Why is it stuck in Oakland? There's got to be a good reason, right? So I'm calling UPS. I'm calling Oakland. And they're just like, bro, just chill out. It's going to get there. I'm like, no, it's not. It's been a week. It's not going to get I need you to figure this out. And so talking and talking. And now, now, now it's a joke between my wife and I. Well, she, it's a joke for her. It, it's painful for me. And she's like, hey, did your package come in? No, it hasn't actually. And I'm making it super easy for, for, for her to pick on me because I'm just on my phone every hour. Re refresh, refresh, right? Where is my, where is my update, right? And so after about three weeks of self-inflicted torture that I did to myself, waiting for this package, I had this brilliant idea. Now, I'm not a brilliant person, but I, but I have my moments sometimes. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to call the company and see if they can do something. I call the company. Hey, my pa it's been like a month, man, like... I live my life on my planner, and I, I can't plan things. It's just, it's rough, you know? <laughs> and they're like, hey, we are so sorry. We're going to send you a new planner. Guys, I got a new planner within two days. It was awesome. And I thought to myself, I spent almost a month refreshing, refreshing. Something's going to change, right? Someday, right? Something's just going to like, click. And I think if we're, if we're being honest with ourselves, not just myself, but all of us, is that we can fall in that same trap. We want new things in our lives, but we're trying the old thing over and over. Refresh, refresh, refresh. And gosh, we're just in a season right now where we got to give grace to ourselves. Like um, in this pandemic, in COVID with the fires, there are so many things changing all the time. But if we're not careful, we could use that as an excuse just to refresh, refresh refresh, but it's still the same. And I think all of us, if we're not careful, we can fall into a thing called someday syndrome. 
Do you know what someday syndrome is? Is that someday this is going to change. Someday I'm going to put more effort into my marriage. Someday I'm going to become the right person instead of looking for the right person. Someday I'm going to talk to someone about this thing in my life that I've just, I've kept inside and I just, I feel like I can't trust anybody, but I'm not going to tell anybody, so I'm going to keep it to myself, but it's dying inside. Someday I'll take that step. Gosh, someday syndrome is, is, is so, um, it's painful. It, it, it's a rough cycle. Someday. All right, we're back. That someday didn't last that long. As I was saying, someday we're going to get there, but someday can be so painful because no one likes to wait. And oftentimes we feel like we're not winning when we're waiting. It feels like we're getting weaker. It feels like things are getting worse. And then unfortunately with Sunday syndrome, we stop taking ownership, but we start blaming things around us. Well, if that person would just talk to me in this way, I wouldn't be so offended. No one's here is offended. I'm not talking to anybody right now. Man, if my boss just heard me and listened to me, I wouldn't be late to work all the time. I'm definitely not talking to anybody right now. It's like we can just live in someday syndrome. And let's be honest, like we've all been there before. I've been there before. We've all had seasons like that. But the question is, do you want to stay in someday or do you want to get to the day? And actually move forward. And so I want to encourage us today that God has something way better than someday syndrome. And I, I want to encourage us because something that's really unfortunate about Sunday syndrome is that not only does our life get put on pause, but we also put our pause on God too. Now, now let, me, let, let me clarify what I mean by that. Is God's everywhere, right? He's in our past. He's in our present. He's in our future. But when we live in someday, either we're either trapped in the past of something or we're anxiously hoping something changes in the future. God is so good, so powerful. He can do anything, but he wants to meet us in the present. And so if we're not willing to meet us in the present, then God can't actually meet us in that place. And so we've got to just kind of take Take away that th those things that really hold us back. And so I'll, there's this thing in Scripture where we don't have to wait for some day, but there's this idea, this reality called that we want to wait on God. So not waiting for some day, but we're going to wait on God. And there's so many examples of in Scripture. But I want to I want to talk about Psalm 27 for a moment. Now I'll give you some history. This is King David. He has been promised to be king. He's been called king. He's anointed to be king, but he has not yet been installed, installed, installed as a king. And so he's on the run. He's being chased. People are trying to murder him. He's hiding in caves. That is a someday moment, okay? When is this going to end? So we see Psalm 27 where he says that, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid he goes in to say that, God, if there's one thing I can ask for, I'm not even going to ask for your protection. I'm going to ask for intimacy with you. I just want to be close with you. And so we get towards the end, and I love David's heart where it says this, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am waiting here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. See, this idea of waiting isn't like, well, let's just see what happens. I hope it gets better. I mean, I, I hope that there is something that's going to happen. No, no. When David says wait, he's saying, hey, I want you to wait out of expectation. I want you to wait confidently. I want you to wait boldly. I want you to wait, not in this place of like someday, but God, when you're ready to move, I'm there. God, actually, I can't see it right now. There's literally fires surrounding me, and not just physical ones, but spiritual ones, but I'm going to wait confidently.
Because even though I can't see it, I know you're working. And that's the confidence of waiting on God, is that we don't have to wait for this moment. We're actively, not passively, we're courageously, not passively, waiting on God. So if we're gonna wait on God, we gotta recalculate. We've been in this series of recalculating where it's like, hey, what if we were to see this in a different light? So I wanna help us shift our minds from waiting for, on, on, on someday, but waiting on someone. Is that we're not just waiting for a thing to happen, but we're believing, we're contending, we're saying yes to God, even if we can't see our eyes. And so we're gonna be diving in, guys, into Romans chapter six, and so again, if you have your Bibles, we are ready to jump in. And let me give you some context. Paul, so the Apostle Paul, he so masterfully uh, puts together this letter where one and two is all about, hey guys, the whole world is waiting for God's salvation. And that we're all sinners. We've all fallen um, short of the glory of God. And the only way for you to receive the free gift of salvation, you can't earn it. You're not worthy, you're not worthy, you're not worthy, we're all not worthy of it. So he gets this, this beautiful picture that the gospel shows us how utterly wicked and sinful we are, while at the same time showing us how utterly loved and val valuable we are in Christ. So now we're coming into Romans 6, where, where Paul says in, in uh, chapter 5 that as sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That, God, that you can't out -sin the grace of God. His grace will cover you, it will conquer, it will do everything to cover you in Christ. So Romans 6, it goes here. Well then, should we keep sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Continue. Or have you forgotten that we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? We joined him in his death. For we died and we were buried with Christ by a baptism. So this baptism, Paul wasn't talking about water baptism. When you look at the scriptures, there's three types of baptism. There's baptism into the family of God, which is salvation. There's water baptism, which is a public declaration of what God has already done in you, through salvation, and then, then there is spirit-filled baptism, which I don't got time for that, but that's another message, okay? And so what Paul was talking about is that don't you remember, have you forgotten, you were baptized with Christ, that Christ actually took your body um, as his, and that he has forgiven you and removed the penalty of your sin. So when he says, have you forgotten, it's like that friend that, you know, like when they slap you and hug you at the same time. You don't know, what hey, did you? That kind of hurt, but I needed that. Paul's saying, listen, he's trying to raise their expectations. Yes, God's grace abounds all the more, but don't you realize like what God has saved you from? Don't go back there. Don't go back to those traps. So Paul was saying, hey, he's trying to elevate our vision of what it means to walk with Jesus, that it's so much more than just towing the line but God has actually removed that from your life. And look what it says, continue. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And so this is beautiful reality where Christ has not just removed the penalty and paid for the penalty of our sins, but we should also expect a resurrection of our lives. Meaning that resurrection, that man, eternity is not just where we're going, but who we're spending it with. That eternity can actually happen right now. Meaning, and, and, and this is where, and again, this is all gonna tie together, is that it's not just about what Christ, and this is, this is a great part, right? It's not just what, what Christ has removed from your life, but it's also what he's called you towards. Look at what it says. He raised him from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we may also live new lives. Sometimes we stay in the someday syndrome because we know that God has removed the penalty of our sins, but we don't have the expectation to walk in newness. There needs to be an understanding that God wants to resurrect dead things and in new things, 
and he has, but if we don't have the expectation for it, we're going to miss it. I, I love this quote from Tim Keller where he says that Christianity isn't about being nice. It's about being new. Meaning that, again, I'm all for positivity, but being a Christian is more than being positive. It's about living from the power that God has given us in Jesus. It's so much more about the, than, than just being a nice person, but I want to be a new person. Hey, anyone can be nice for a couple of days. And some of you really nice people, <laughs> you, you can be nice for a month, right? But give us some time, right? <laughs> give us some time. That niceness is going to come off, right? We need to, don't be pointing at anybody here, okay? <laughs> right? We need to have some resurrection power. We need to have some newness, some transformation. And I love, uh, uh, go back to the last scripture if you can. Um, I love how the NIV says that now you must walk in newness. That word walk, it means that your daily conduct, every single day, I'm going to walk in newness. Not in just modifying my, my, my behavior, right? That's great. Have, have morals. Have all those things. But I don't want to settle for God modifying my behavior. I need him to change my heart. I need him to bring newness to our lives because religion is very exhausting. But newness from God is invigorating. It's exciting. It brings, it, brings, it brings goodness to our lives. And so we're just at the beginning, but I want us to catch this. If we don't catch this, the rest isn't going to make any sense. And so we need, to, we need to raise the expectation of our lives that God has removed the penalty of our sins, but he's also given us the power of the resurrection to walk in newness. Someday wants to sit and just, well, it's gone, Removal of my sins, waiting on someone says, I'm going to walk in newness and in power. But Paul, Paul, Paul continues where he says this, in verse 5. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Continue. For when we die with Christ, we were set free from the power of your sin. Look to your neighbor and say, set free. Online, say set free in the chat. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this. Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Just, just, just let the words of Scripture wash over you that you've been set free from the power of sin. Because again, like, imagine if you are in Rome and you're reading this letter from Paul, like, okay, you're telling me that, like, my sin's been removed, that I should be a new person, but I know how horrible I am. I know all, like, my tendencies, and I just, how can you say I'm new? Aren't I just new, or I'm bad, or I'm good, or I'm this? Well, you're new, and you're learning to be new. Which one is it? It's yes. It's, it's both. And I love this. So Paul has given us this picture where imagine if you have been in a jail cell. Your arms are tied behind your back. Your legs are chained up, and you are restricted. There is no movement. And even if you were to gain a little movement, you're surrounded by a cage, a jail cell. And that's the picture that God gives us when we are separated from him. Not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally. So what, what Paul is saying is that, hey, because you've been buried with Christ, because, you, you, because you're going to be raised with him, that now that the power of sin has been broken, meaning that your arms are no longer bound, your legs are no longer chained, and that the door is now open. But you need to choose to walk out. That the power of sin has been broken, but now we got to learn how to live in the power that God has given us. So if you're like, gosh, this whole Christian thing is, is not natural for me. For me. Neither for any. Join the club. <laughs> There's this really big sanctification, uh, word, sorry, theological word called sanctification. All that it means is we're learning to become more like Jesus. So it's like, and this isn't my thing. No, no, you, ha you haven't given it 
time. You got to give God time that our lives with Christ is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And I just, oh, my heart grieves for believers where it's like, man, they, they I, I mean this in all sensitivity where they try God for a week or two, but then it doesn't work. So they go to something else. So you got to give, if you, <laughs> if you've been eating cheeseburgers from your favorite fast food restaurant, I almost said a, a, a company, but I don't want to say that. If you've been eating <laughs> Amen. If you've been eating from that restaurant your whole life, but then you get a, a pure premium steak, you can be like, oh, that, that's, that, that's terrible. It's because your taste buds are used to the old thing. And so you got to give God time to work those things out in, inside of you. And so God has broken the chains off of you, but we're learning how to walk that out. You know, I love movies. Like, I could... I could spend a whole day just watch like five, six movies, like no problem at all. Now, don't take me to the movies with you because if, if you like all movies, I don't like all, I am a critic. And I will tell you after the movie why that's terrible or that plot point didn't make sense. That music did not fit that scene. That was just, that was terrible. Now, I won't be that person that talks in the movie. You know who you are? I'm not, I, I, I refuse to go to the movies with you. We can be friends, but just not in the movie theater, okay? But as it, when it comes to like, man, after movie, I, will, I am a critic. But I think that most movies, they kind of follow the same flow, right? Where there's a, good, there, there's a good guy, good girl, bad guy, bad girl, good guy gets in a problem. Seems like the good guy or bad girl, or, uh, bad, girl bad guy is going to succeed. And then the hero, right? They figure out a way to pull it off, right? The whole rest of the movie is saying, how am I going to figure this out? How am I going to strive and, and, and to make this happen? I think about like the Gladiator movie, Russell Crowe, where he was down and out, but he figured out the end, right? There's just so many great movies. And I think, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, we try to pattern our lives in that same way, where we make ourselves the hero in God's story, where, man, God has set us free from the power of sin, but I'm going to figure that I'm going to figure out how to get on my jail cell. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to work out this relationship. I'm going to figure out how I can get better in striving. If you're taking notes, write this down. Striving is the biggest enemy to walking in victory. And what I mean by striving, I'm not saying putting pressure. I'm not saying you got to work out your salvation, right? Salvation is free, but you got to learn how to walk it out. But there's this striving that comes from our own self-sufficiency. There's a striving that comes from our own pride that I am going to figure this out. And this is why I love small groups. Small groups is a great way where maybe you don't need a friend today, but you're going to need one at some point. You're going to need someone to encourage you, and you get the privilege to be an encourager to somebody else. Striving is the enemy to working out the victory in your life. And one of the ways that you know that you're striving is when's the last time completely vulnerable and honest about something you were struggling with, with somebody else that wasn't Jesus, that wasn't, it wasn't in a chat room, right, that was a person your life that you could trust because striving happens when we feel we have to figure everything out and we stay in the cell and can I remind you the cell's been broken the door is open you can you can walk out striving is the enemy to us walking in victory now I've told this story many times and I hope no one gets tired of it and honestly it's not it's not the most comfortable story um, to tell but I like to tell it because I know it helps people to be set free. You know, for many years, um, growing up and in college, um, because there's kids in this room, I won't say exactly what it is, but you'll get my gist, is that I was falling in areas of my life of, of, of impurity. There was things that I was watching on the, on the TV, things that I was watching on the, on the computer that were just toxic to my soul, harmful, that... I, I, I didn't want to do that. I, I felt so just caught up in. And, and I had that same idea of, of someday, <laughs> someday I'll stop doing that. Someday God will deliver me. Someday I'll actually tell a trusted guy so I don't have to have this in my soul. Someday. 
And guys, can I tell you, though, those someday years were so painful. So, just thinking about it, ooh, this gets me still. It's uh, the, the, the shame that comes from it, the, the embarrassment. I cry a lot. The, 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 this isn't a big thing, so. <laughs> really, I'm, I've been through a lot of therapy. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, You guys are crazy. So there, there's, 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 there was just so much pain. And you know what made it worse? Being a Christian. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know the right thing, the wrong thing. You know the life that God calls you. And so I want to encourage you. It's totally possible to love God and it's still struggle. But my encouragement to you is that God loves you where you're at, but he just doesn't want you to stay there. He loves you so much that he wants to get you walking in newness, that he doesn't, he hasn't called you to stay dead and stuck in your sin, but he wants to bring life. You know, these things can be hard to talk about in a big room. Oh, I'm the small group pastor, so I'm going to say it again, Okay. But this is why we have groups of, uh, of 8, 10, 15. So you have trusted relationships. Hey, I may not be struggling here, but gosh, I got a pride problem. I need some help. Like, can, can, can you pray for me once a week? We have that. And so for me, I, I, I was so stuck, just utterly stuck. And there was so much shame. I was in ministry. I was serving people. It was like, oh, it was, it was, it was a horrible feeling, to say the least. And so, long story short, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of components that came, that came to God bringing victory in my life. When you look at your life, do you see yourself dead to sin? I'm not saying, are you perfect? I'm not a perfect person. <laughs> Revelation at all. That should be a reminder, okay, of our grace. Is that I'm not asking you if you're perfect. I'm not even asking you if, if, you, if, you're, if you're working it out. But do you have the perspective of it's not about what you're doing, but what God has already done. Striving all about what you need to do. Victory, walking in newness. It's like, I can walk in newness because God's paved the way. I don't need to make my own way. God has paved the way. And I, 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 was, I was praying for you this morning. Um, we have an incredible team. They were serving here, and I was, I was just walking around the building and praying. And I, I got this sense, and I don't think it's just for baptism, but I think it has to do with people, uh, for some people, in, in regards to baptism. Sometimes we can wait to get water baptized because we're waiting until we do something great. Until I get into a Bible study, until I join a small group, until I join these things, but there's something wrong, there's something, I get it, but there's something wrong about that. Your baptism is about what you're doing, but not about what Christ has done. We're waiting for some day, but the greatest day has already happened. The greatest day has already happened. The greatest day was when he paid for everything and that you just need to freely receive it. And so don't wait for some day because the greatest day has already happened. And so my question is, Consider yourselves, there, there, there's two principles I want us to grab, okay? Does your perspective and does your posture align with what God's already done? This is, this is like, this is, this is the waiting part, okay? I'm not going to wait passively. I'm going to wait aggressively. I'm going to wait acting on faith. I'm going to wait with expectation in my perspective, but also in my posture, so let's talk about our perspective, okay? Your perspective is your outlook on things. Somebody wise said that it's not about just what you're thinking about, but we need to pay attention to what we're actually thinking about. And Psalm 1 is a, is a beautiful picture where Psalm 1 tells us, blessed are those who don't sit in the seat of sinners. Blessed are those who don't sit in the council of mockers, but you're blessed when you meditate on the scriptures day and night, you're like, a, you're like a tree planted in streams of living water. You bear fruit every season. Your leaves never wither. And you bear fruit every season. There is something beautiful that when we meditate on God's word, 
It transforms us. I'm not a reader. I'm not asking you to be a reader. I'm asking you to love God and to follow God. And we, we get funny about this word meditation. I'm not a meditator. All that meditation means is that what you pay attention to in your mind. Some of us, we've been paying attention and meditating on offense. Some of us, we've been meditating and paying attention to past hurt. Some of us, we've been meditating and, and, and thinking about how crazy life is and how we just can't get control. What I'm urging you and encouraging all of us to do, meditate on God's word instead. And I think sometimes, you know, again, this is where the Sunday syndrome can get a hold of us, where it's like, well, I got in the word and it didn't speak to me. So someday I'll try it again. I've been there. I get that. I, I was listening to this podcast about how awesome our Navy SEALs are. Like they're the best of the best in the world. And uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can clap for that. Yeah. I'm definitely not one. So like they're awesome. I've watched movies though on Navy SEALs. Anyways, they asked them, hey, how are you guys the best of the best? How are you guys, like, when you go in, you just rise the occasion. Basically, they're asking, how can we do this in our, in, in our normal lives? And one of the guys from the Navy SEAL says, listen, you don't rise the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. In other words, you don't rise to the expectation. You fall to your preparation. Meaning that if you haven't already put your reps in, if you haven't already put the work in, you're probably not gonna make it. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is getting in the scriptures isn't necessarily about what you're getting in the moment, but it's preparing your mind. It's preparing your heart. So when that when you're feeling like, oh, like I'm just, the enemy is surrounding me in every corner. No, I will be confident in the Lord. I will wait for his goodness. And so the best day to start is today. So that that's, that's your perspective. But let's talk about your posture. Your posture is about your obedience. So outlook is cute, right? I, oh, I'm, I'm gonna change my outlook. Yeah, I can do that, that's cool. Obedience has to do with your actions. And there are some things that God cannot release in our lives until we're obedient. I can, <laughs> I've, whew, I've been teaching my daughter, baby. Great to share. I know you love your toys, but man, it's great to share. And it's like, she can know that, she can get that, but she won't experience it unless she actually gives it away, even for a moment. And God has that same mentality for us. He has that same heart for us, that if you live in the reality, where I did, I'm, I'm believing right now there are things that God has asked us to do, but we've been reluctant to. And I'm not saying that's holding you back from your someday, but wouldn't you want that just a little bit quicker? Wouldn't you want this a little bit faster knowing that you weren't part of the delay? But also, the word says that when you obey God, it's not a, it's not a burden. It's, it's a blessing. And so I want to I wanna encourage us and I want to challenge all of us. First Sunday in September, we were doing 21 days of fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer isn't about getting God's attention. It's about getting our attention back on God. And I'm believing that as you journey with us, as you pray, as you fast, it could be food, it could be social media. You probably shouldn't do a fast on social media. I mean, whatever you fast, all that we're doing is we're moving all the obstacles, all the junk, saying, God, here I am, speak to me. And whatever you speak to me, I'm gonna obey. And it's our perspective but it's our posture. And if we can get our perspective right, if we can get our posture right, if we can get in alignment from what God's already done, we're not gonna wait for victory. We're gonna walk in it. We're gonna walk in newness and we're gonna walk in the new life that, that God has for us.